Franz von Kearney, Writings by Frank Schmidt, on the Danube Swabian people. These collected writings are republished in memory of the author, Frank Schmidt, so that others may continue to enjoy his work. May his spirit live on. Gruss Gott. What do you say to your fellow Donauschwaben when you meet for the first time? Why Gruss Gott? Good day, of course. That is how I was greeted by relatives and strangers alike when I traveled to Germany in the spring of 1990. I went there to research my family history and to meet relatives with whom I had been corresponding, but never met. I traced my roots to a German village in the Banat, the Quitter and Biero families from Johannesfeld. Early in this century, my grandparents immigrated to America to seek a better life, which they eventually found. The relatives they left behind did not fare as well. After World War I, the Habsburg Empire collapsed, and my relatives found themselves to be citizens of Romania rather than Hungary. After World War II, the villages of the Banat were devastated by the cruel acts of communist rulers who gained control of the region. Because of the turmoil after World War II and the deaths of my grandparents, no contact with my European relatives had taken place since the early 1950s. I had no idea where my relatives were. When I started doing genealogical research a few years earlier, I learned that the Donauschwaben have their own genealogical society, the Arbietzgreis Donauschwabischer Familienforscher. I began writing letters to people in the United States and Germany who were active in society. One thing led to another, and I soon found myself completely intrigued by learning more about my family history. I traveled to Johannesfeld in 1988, and with the help of a translator, was able to make contact with some family members there. From these relatives, I was also able to find others who had gone to Germany, and I began corresponding with them. In the spring of 1990, I decided to visit these relatives and do some sightseeing in Germany and Switzerland. I flew from Chicago to Zurich, and the following day, rented a car and drove to Sindelfing in Germany. The next day, May 1 was Labor Day and May Day, a national holiday in Germany. So there were bands playing in the Marktplatz, marketplace, all day. And a maypole was raised in the square. Food and beer were sold from booths surrounding the square, and the atmosphere was very festive. The next day, I went to the Haus der Donauschwaben, the Museum Historical Archive and Genealogical Library, dedicated to preserving the cultural history of the Danube Swabians. As I walked up the steps, an elderly couple greeted me by saying, Gruss Gott, Vroom, a phrase I recognized as a traditional Donauschwaben greeting. It made me feel good to be greeted so warmly by someone I had never seen before. I walked through the museum, beginning with a room that was filled with large maps and pictures that had captions relating the history of the Danube Swabians in Hungary, Yugoslavia, and Romania. Another room was furnished to look like a typical parlor in Bannett Village House. Another held glass showcases filled with mannequins dressed in tractant from various villages. Later, Herr Joseph Eder took me into the library and helped me do some research. Herr Eder spoke virtually no English, and at that time, I knew only a few useful traveler's phrases in German. But somehow, we managed to communicate. The following day, I drove to Karlsruhe in Baden, Württemberg. Soon after arriving, I telephoned my cousin Hermine and spent the evening with her and her husband Diethard. Hermine was born in Chakwa and Diethard in Grabatz. They met while studying at the university in Temeshberg, Romania. Diethard left Romania for Germany in 1984. His parents also live in Karlsruhe and his father is president of the Donauschwaben Club there. Hermine joined Diethard after their marriage in 1986. They showed me videotapes of their wedding in Chikawa and of a Tractenfest, costume festival, in Timisoara. Communication was no problem at all because Diethard has learned quite a bit of English from watching American television programs and listening to American rock music. The next day, I took a day trip to Gundelfingen, a small city in the Black Forest region near Freiburg in Brisgau. I went to visit my cousin Franz and his wife Helene, both teachers, although Franz is now retired. He is president of the Donauschwaben Club in Freiburg. Franz was born in Demeshburg, and Helene was also born in the Banat region. They left Romania in 1973. Communication was a little more difficult because Franz had picked up only a little English from American soldiers when he was a prisoner of war during World War II. Helene's mother was born in Johannesfeld, and I showed her the book I had been given a centennial history of the village that had been written in 1906. I showed her where my grandfather's name was, listed as having gone to America, and she showed me her grandfather's name. He was one of the authors of the book. I spent the following day back in Karlsruhe with Hermine and Diethard, walking through the zoo, then to their apartment for lunch, then to Karlsruhe's most well-known edifice, the Schloss of Markgraf Karl Wilhelm, which was rebuilt after being damaged in World War II. We only saw the Schloss from the outside because we were so busy talking that the interior was closed by the time we got around to thinking about going in. The next day, we drove to Weissenbach near Heidelberg to visit Hans Hermine's uncle, and of course my cousin. Hans was born in Avanda, and his wife Erika was born in Johannesfeld. Their two children, Lolita and Gwynther, were born in Temesburg. Hans left Romania in 1979 to take Lolita to Germany for a heart operation. Something went wrong during surgery, and Lolita's legs were paralyzed. Hearing this, 
Erica left Gwynther with relatives and crossed the border illegally hidden in a hay wagon with three men who were also leaving Romania without travel passes. They were caught in Yugoslavia and sent to jail there for two weeks. During that time, they were not allowed to notify anyone, and no one in the family knew if Erica was dead or alive. Finally, they were released to the Austrian embassy, and Erica made her way to Germany. Later, they got Gwynther out of Romania and settled in Weissenbach, where Hans is a teacher in a real shul. I visited with the family in their home. Then we drove to Heidelberg to see the remains of a famous old castle on the Necker River. Once again, we talked so much that by the time we thought about taking a tour inside the castle, it was closed. After Karlsruhe, I drove to Hamburg in the Saarland to visit Helmut, who is not a relative but a genealogist who helped with my research. Helmut fled Lazarfeld, Yugoslavia in 1944, following behind German soldiers as they retreated from the advance of Joseph Tito's partisan forces. Helmut spoke no English, but he and I both speak French. So we communicated quite well. He drove me to an archive at the university in Saarbrücken and showed me documents about the Reeve family of Hangard, Germany, where some ancestors lived before going to Hungary. The village of Hangard was close by, so we decided to go there to see if anyone from the Reeve family still lived there. Hangard is a very small village, and the residents were not accustomed to seeing outsiders. So when we stopped a woman on the street to ask some questions, people came out of their houses to stare at us. When we asked if she knew anyone named Reeb, she directed us to a house up the street, the home of a man who said he was a farmer who drinks too much. We didn't ask him if he drank too much, but he told us he had a brother in the village, but they didn't speak to each other. We found the brother at home, and both men were astonished to learn that they had American relatives. Because of Helmut's research, he knew more about the family history than they did, even though they lived in the original village of their ancestors. Next, I drove to Ingelheim and Rhine, a small city in Rhineland Falls. There, I visited Anton, another genealogist who has been very helpful to me. Anton spoke a little English he learned when he was a prisoner of war. He was born in Umbach, and his wife, Eva, in Pariah Mosh, immigrated to Germany right after the war. Anton took us on an afternoon tour of the region, starting with the remains of an ancient wall, which once surrounded Charlemagne's castle in Ingelheim. We crossed the Rhine on a car ferry and visited Ruitheim am Rhine, where we saw the statue called Germania, a tribute to the defeat of France and the unification of Germany in 1870. We continued driving along the Rhine and saw many of the castles that appear so frequently in tourist photos of Germany. We saw the place of the Lorley, where a golden-haired maiden's captivating song is said to have distracted sailors so that their ships would sink after crashing into the dangerous rocks nearby. Men going up the river today will not hear an enchanting song, but they might be distracted by the bronze statue of a maiden with enormous breasts that now sits on a tiny island in the middle of the Rhine. I left Ingelheim and drove south along the Rhine and through the Black Forest to Basel, Switzerland. From there, I drove east through the Low Alps, often literally through the mountains, via an alpine tunnel on the way back to Zurich. My trip was rewarding in many ways. Since I spent most of the time with relatives and took most of my meals with them, I had the opportunity to see their homes and see how people really lived. I learned a lot from my relatives about their experiences in leaving their homeland and resettling in Germany. With the exception of Hermine and her uncles, Hans, none of the people I visited knew each other, but I was struck by the similarities among them. I was amused to see that each of them had a file folder where they kept all the letters I had sent them. Such is German orderliness. But then I had a file folder for each of them. So what am I talking about? All had gardens and grew the same fruit-bearing plants that grew in the German villages of their old homeland, where each house had a kitchen garden. I had taken photos of my family along, and each time I showed them I was asked the same thing, are all of your brothers and sisters still living? All of them had lost family members due to the war, the camps after the war, or poor health conditions in communist Romania. Oh, what we take for granted. I will definitely go back to Germany as more relatives from Romania have moved there since 1990. After I returned from my trip, I received a surprise telephone call from Germany. It was another lost. Relative from Johannesfeld, my mother's first cousin, who had been wondering about her American cousins ever since the family stopped receiving letters from my grandmother back in the 1950s. The letters stopped coming because that is when my grandmother died. But now they will start anew. So after many years of silence, our families have met again. Wrapping up this captivating journey, we've explored the author's inspiring quest to rediscover their Donauschwaben heritage in Germany. Two key aspects stood out First, we joined the author as they embarked on a heartfelt expedition, traversing towns like Sindelfingen, Karlsruhe, Freiburg, and Hamburg. Through these visits, they rekindled connections with family members who had ventured from the Banat region due to historical upheavals. Their interactions shed light on the deep bonds of family that persisted despite years of separation. Secondly, language barriers and historical challenges didn't deter the author's determination to bridge the gap. They ventured into genealogical research, explored cultural landmarks, and uncovered stories that painted a vivid picture of their Donauschwaben roots. Now, here's a thought to ponder. How did the author's journey to Germany help them not only connect with their heritage, but also mend relationships with distant relatives? 
I'm eager to read your reflections on these key aspects and the question posed. Share your insights in the comments below. If you found this episode as engaging as I did, remember to give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and don't forget to share it with your circle. Taking these small actions goes a long way in supporting the channel and spreading awareness about the history of the Danube Swabians. And if this particular story resonated with you, there's more to explore on this channel. So be sure to dive into more captivating narratives. Plus, sharing them with your friends, families, and clubs can be a wonderful way to contribute to the growth of the channel and the sharing of historical knowledge. Until next time, keep exploring, learning, and cherishing the rich tapestry of history. Wir sind Donau, Schwaben, Kinders, Kinder.